All right, welcome to episode 56 of Seize the Moment podcast. And today we have a very special guest. We have Borough President Eric Adams. And Eric served as an officer in the New York City Transit Police and then in the New York City Police Department for 22 years. Eric was first elected to the New York State Senate in 2006, serving for four terms until late 2013. Welcome, Eric. Glad to have you on. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that the name of your podcast is probably so relevant. I'll seize the moment all over the entire country. We're seeing a shift in how yeah. people are living and people are see seizing the moment uh, for reform and police reform, for health, our environment. So, you know, I don't know if you thought about it when you created the name, but you're right, seizing the moment. No, that's for sure. I mean, honestly, it's it's not a just it's not just about um, being present to the moment. It's also about taking action and having the courage to take action, and not letting injustices just you know um, happen without acting. If I mean, uh, what's the definition of evil? It's when good men don't act. Mm -hmm. So mm. I mean, it's it's important what's happening right now in the country. Yeah. And, and so, Eric, what's it been like for you being on the front lines of the protests? And also, like, what are your thoughts on the Black Lives Matter movement? And that's, those are both uh, questions that I think are real uh, apropos to today. Number one, uh, that, as you indicated, it's being present in the moment does not mean being there and ignoring the moment and yeah. ignoring what you see around you. And I, I have been a little disappointed uh, throughout the years, how many good people knew bad things were happening and they were present. They knew they were happening and they ignored those things. And so oftentimes people ask me now, uh, Eric, what's different now than the previous times that police uh, misconduct took place? And we should always be very clear. Every man or woman that puts on a bulletproof vest to protect citizens should not be considered to be bad, because that is not true. Uh, what happens too often is that too many good cops don't stand up and talk about the behavior of bad cops, which is a small number, but can make a significant impact. And too many good citizens have ignored um, what was happening in their cities. Uh, Jack Nicholson has a quote in the the movie A Few Good Men, where he stated, you really can't handle the truth. And many people knew that we were treating different groups wrongly, but they basically said, do what you have to do to keep uh, my block safe, my building safe, even if it means uh, trampling on the rights of those who were being unfairly treated. And that is what we're seeing now played out across the entire uh, country, if not the entire globe. Yeah. yeah. And right now you see all these conversations happening now about, you know, um, how, do we, how do we vet the police? Like how, or um, can we get uh, them to do uh, other kinds of training, for example, like de-escalation training or um, repealing uh, like uh, Section 50A, for example, right? And making certain records public um, to people and having sort of some kind of civilian oversight on what the police is doing. Um, what, what are your thoughts on that? A, a couple of things that you just laid out. Uh, getting this right, public safety, is a puzzle. And that puzzle uh, has many pieces. And if we just focus on one piece, we're going to be back here again. Mm -hmm. so the goal is to look at all of the pieces and put them together. Uh, and so when you look at it, 50A, 50A is a law that requires uh, police records to be available to the public to review how many complaints they have for overuse of force, their disciplinary record. I had a record as a police officer, just as a person that commits a crime um, would have a record. Mm. But that is just a piece. And let me tell you why that putting the pieces together is significant. Mm. I spoke to the mayor last week about allowing local precincts to choose their precinct commanders. 
Huh. Precinct commanders, they're one of the most powerful people in our city, and many people are not aware of that. They control a geographical piece of real estate. They're basically the mayor of that area. They determine what laws would be enforced at a higher level than others. They determine who can get a permit to hold a block party. Um, what businesses, if you sell alcohol, they can take away your liquor license through complaints to the state liquor authority. So they have so much power. But what has happened in many areas, they don't have any say so in who is their precinct commander. So my proposal to the mayor and police commissioner was that the police commissioner would give three recommendations of commanders who meet the minimum requirement to be a commander of a precinct. Then the community board and the precinct council will come together and interview the three candidates, find out what, what, is, uh, what are their visions for the community, how do they see building better relationships, how do they believe they should fight crime, and they should review their past records and that is what 58 would allow them to do. Previously, you would not be able to review their records. Mm -hmm. But now with 58 signed into law, they can now review their records. Now, let me tell you why that's important. Mm -hmm. There was a young girl doing one of the demonstrations. She was shoved to the ground by a police officer yep. and she hit her head. The person who was standing next to that, that cop in the white shirt was the precinct commander from the 73rd precinct. He came from a precinct in Rockaway where the residents asked the police commissioner to get him out of there because he was discourteous, disrespectful, and they felt they had no communication with him. He was then sent to the 73rd precinct in Brownsville where they have a historical bad relationship with their police, but no one knew his prior record. And, but if we had a system in place like 58, where they can review the record and make a determination if they want them or not, then you have police community involvement and people know who's in their community. So that's why the 58 law is part of the piece to the puzzle that can actually make policing the right picture we're looking for. It's brilliant. I love that so much. And so, Eric, in reading the, um, the interview that you had in the NY Magazine uh, website, and obviously their platform, and then also your recent CNN op-ed. So we read that essentially what you were proposing is that some police officers, as in the case of some doctors, right, are not necessarily meant for every particular involvement or interaction possible for an officer. So what you mentioned was essentially that we need to have a particularly trained group that sort of um, was dealt or meant to deal with the protests and meant to deal with sort of de-escalating and defusing certain scenarios. So you argue that just like a doctor in every scenario wouldn't necessarily be a trained surgeon, right, in the sense of a policeman, he would kind of necessarily, or he or she would not necessarily be trained for, let's say, wouldn't be the optimal person for, let's say, being involved in protests or being involved potentially in different, um, maybe even potentially riots, right? But essentially, any sort of scenario that really nego really uh, requires a negotiator more so than obviously kind of like an army man or an army person. So, can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, and, and it's so important. Uh, uh, every person in a career is not meant for every assignment in the career. Mm -hmm. And you, you pointed out um, an emergency room doctor has a different level of skill. A trauma, a level one trauma center is a different training than a person who's doing, who's a, who a podiatrist or who uh, is a brain surgeon. I mean, it's just, just a different level. It doesn't mean they don't meet the basic medical requirement. It just states that uh, many of our skill set and characteristics and abilities allow us to do certain aspects of a career uh, better or differently. And so when I was a platoon commander in the 88th precinct, oh, wow. when I would have an extremely dangerous encounter, going after someone with a gun, having to kick a door in, the cop that was there with me may not be the same cop I want at a march. If you spent 10 years, 15 years chasing drug dealers, wrestling with people on the street, 
uh, fighting with people with guns, making guns, gun arrests, dealing with very violent people. And then all of a sudden, you're told that, hey, we have a protest tomorrow. Put on your uniform if you're playing clothes and go stand at a march somewhere. That is a very challenging thing to do. And some people would say, well, all cops should be able to do it. No, we can't live and police in the ideal. We have to police in the real. And just as we don't do this in any other profession, we shouldn't do it in policing. Now, that does not mean the mere fact you get a change in assignment, you should be abusive. No. But it, what it means is we have to understand the trauma that goes with being in violent encounters all the time. We have to build out outlets to allow those officers who are on the front line and really their battle fatigue. We need to give them outlets to allow them to de-escalate their emotion. Because if you, if you are in that front line of crime fighting all the time, and you're never really given sabbaticals, you're never really given moments where you can renew yourself, you begin to see everyone as a, cr a criminal. As they say, if all you do is walk around with a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. And that is what we see at these protests. If you spend 10 years, five years of being a hammer all the time, even when you go to a peaceful protest, the people who are marching and chanting and maybe saying things that are offensive, they look like a nail to you. And that is why you get those responses oftentimes at many of these peaceful gatherings. And so you can have those officers there, but they should not be on the front line. They should be layers back, there should be a real conversation with them before they go out. There should be moments of meditation. There should be moments of reinforcing what your assignment is. And then we need to re-culture um, what you're doing there to let you know this is not about going after people that are violent. This is about a peaceful demonstration. Right. Mm -hmm. And it kind of seems like one of the major issues, at least, you know, from my perspective, is that there seems to be black and white thinking involved, where there's this us against them mentality, where from one perspective, the idea is like, you know, sort of we're on this side and the other side hates us. So now we have to make sure that sort of obviously that we're safe and kind of like in doing that, obviously, they kind of, um, what's the word? They, um, they sort of... <sighs> They're kind of, I mean, it's like tribal thinking, like us versus them, right? Right. And it's sort of excessive force and the way of thinking like, okay, like in order to protect ourselves, we have to, instead of being on defense, we more so have to be on offense to protect ourselves. So I wonder then, Eric, from your perspective, what is it that that would entail for a police officer in the front line? Um, would they need some sort of special training in terms of mental health slash negotiation training? Mm -hmm. Would you also advocate for that kind of police officer to also be in therapy themselves? Um, would it be some combination of that on top of obviously time off? meditation practices and other maybe factors? Yes, and, and, and where we are now is that it is time for us to be honest. Uh, anyone who, who has attended NA or AA will tell you the first step towards recovery is that simple sentence, I am. I am an alcoholic. I am uh, a, a abuse of narcotics, you know, I am, whatever. You have to really acknowledge who you are. We have not done that in policing. And we attempt to cover up and say, as a police agency, we don't see bias. We don't see race. We don't see different culture, lifestyles. That is not true. We're human beings. And I think the new form of police training is going to have to start with the right acknowledgement of who we are. And number one, acknowledge that everyone is not cut out for policing, you know, and the challenges of policing. And number two, really interface neurologists into police training on how the, how the brain operates. Our brain is a tool. It is a clear tool that operates a certain way. It stores information and data it has a fright and flight uh, aspect of it. It deals with trauma and how it manifests itself. It doesn't know the difference between going through something and thinking about something. The chemicals that are released when you're going through a traumatic experience is in your brain and your body doesn't know the difference. We're hardwired a certain way. So part of police training 
needs to deal with the operation of the brain and how the brain can impact and how you carry out your job every day. And some of your biases, um, a lot of our training does not deal with, if I grew up in a certain area, in African-American community, and all I know is African-Americans, and if I have to go police an Asian community or a Russian-speaking community or Italian community, if I don't really understand how my personal biases can get in the way of me effectively policing that community, and I just walk away with the understanding, well, I no longer see that they're different from what I'm used to, then I am really at a disadvantage when it's time to police in a multicultural, multi-ethnic environment and lifestyle like uh, a place like New York City. Right. And I know, so Alan has a lot of good questions and I just want to kind of intervene with one quick thing. No, please. So, um, so in terms of like cognitive distortions and biases, what's so interesting is so the person, so he's a cognitive psychologist. He teaches, I believe, at the University of Jerusalem. I'm not sure if he still teaches there. His name is Daniel Kahneman. He wrote the book, Thinking Fast and Slow, which Rachel loves. Um, and so he pretty much said, uh, so see, he was asked a question of like, they said, you know, look, since you are the expert on cognitive distortions, right, it must be the case that obviously that you don't experience many distortions in your thinking right you must have like a clear way of seeing the world and he laughed at the interviewer and he said that's absurd he's like i've actually had the same amount of distorted thinking that i had before so really the only difference is that now he's able to examine it and challenge it it's not that those distortions don't ever pop up and he doesn't have this sort of black and white idealized view of himself where he thinks oh yes i'm just genius who can see things clearly no no no. he just says no i'm actually just more aware of the distortions and i have a better sense of them and then i'm able to challenge them but everybody has this thinking and yeah I agree with that the best way to kind of begin is to start admitting that about ourselves I, I was writing down the name of that book that sounded like a great book yeah thinking and fast it, and slow mm -hmm. all right and as much as I attempt to not have those cognitive distortions the goal is to recognize when you're doing it that is really what you are after uh, as we continue to exercise our, uh, our muscle memory, it is about how do I identify where I am? And that is part of being present in the moment, mm -hmm. of knowing where you are. Where am I right now? What am I feeling? Being aware of your emotions and why you're doing things. That has helped so much for me. Doesn't mean I don't lose my temper, that I don't get angry that I don't do or say things I wish I would not have, but it allows me to recalibrate myself and say, wait a minute, where am I right now? What am I feeling right now? What is this emotion and why is it here? And it has been extremely, extremely helpful. So you never become uh, perfect, but you become a person that is continuously trying to correct those missteps that we do as human beings. Mm -hmm. Right. And why do you think there was such a, a huge response um, to the death of George Floyd? Because so many people, you know, this has happened before, right? Uh, plenty of times with Trayvon Martin, Emmett Till, yep. Eric Gardner, Breonna Sandra Taylor. Brown, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the list goes on and there's even people on the list that we don't even know about, right? Countless people. Um, yeah, why, why do you think there was um, like this much of a response? Even other countries even got in on the, on the protests. Yeah. Very good question. And I am not a, a sociologist. Um, yeah. I only took one course. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but yeah. but uh, as a, you know, trained investigator and observer, I believe several things happened. I saw something amazing happen when Donald Trump was elected. And I remember sitting down with my staff and I saw for the most, for the, for the first time in my life, mass tragic disappointment in white America that I never saw before. Mm. And you remember after Trump election, remember what happened. There was a Me Too movement. Right. That yep. swept the entire globe. And then to add to that, you had coronavirus. Yeah. And as I spent my days on the front line of coronavirus, I had a front row seat 
to the shaking of the foundation of white America. I saw the number of whites that were on food pantry lines, unsure of where their next meal was coming from. The movement of not being able to pay rent and the entire a no rent movement in the city. People were unable to know if they could pay their rent, losing their homes, the uncertainty that their children would not be able to get an education because schools were closed, inability to get proper health care. Uh, I was speaking to a young lady who was on a food pantry line. She had an Ivy League degree and she said she was furloughed and she was scared. I believe that when you look at the marches and you see the marches of yesteryears, when the Diallos, the Luimas, and others, they were predominantly black marches. But I believe white America has reached a point, we know now what it feels like to be black. And we know what it is to be scared all the time. Because what white America is going through now with Trump and coronavirus, that is the story of black America. Mm -hmm. One day from being thrown out of their home, not getting the proper due that they deserve in their jobs, being denied promotions, unable to know if their next meal is coming, lack of access to health care. You just described what black America has been experienced. So I believe when you're hearing white marches that have grown in such a high level say Black Lives Matter, I really believe they're saying their lives matter. And they seeing it vicariously through the experience of being Black in America. Wow, that is like one of the most profound things I've heard all year. I'm actually, wow, I don't, I don't have anything even to I, say. I, I, one thing, um, this is kind of like a taboo question, but it does need to be discussed. Um, I guess with the protests and coronavirus at the same time that puts i guess politicians and people in authority in a weird spot because uh it is it is an important movement and it does need the attention that it's getting it does have to be protested about 100 percent. not going to argue that uh just the thing is with Corona, right? Like not everyone's probably going to be properly social distancing. I'm sure there's people who are trying to do it. Right. Uh, you, you still have people wearing masks, not wearing masks and this and that. And it's kind of hard to ha like, how do you balance right. both situations at the same time? Because I mean, what's going on now with the process is like at the forefront of our mind. Right. And I, it should be, but at the same time with this, right. It, how do you weigh, how do you weigh the two? Together? How do you weigh the two? Yeah, and that's a, that's that is an excellent question, and I I recall reading a, a quote: "Nothing is more dangerous than a man with nothing to lose." Mm -hmm. And I remember on September 11, two thousand and one, when the Trade Center collapsed, and I remember that night when I was there, and after I went into Brownsville, I wanted to you know economically challenging parts of the city to talk to the young people because I thought they were traumatized over what really traumatized the country, if not the globe. And I pulled up and I went to the young men. They were playing basketball in dominoes. And I said, you guys didn't hear what happened. Uh, the trade center was attacked. And they said, Lou, you know, a, a slang for Lieutenant, mm -hmm. Lou, when those buildings were up, we had rats in our apartment. We didn't have heat. Uh, we had lead paint. Our, our community was unsafe. We were unemployed. We were harassed by the police. So those buildings being up or down is not changing our condition. That is their problem, not our problem. And so when we go to young people now and say, listen, you shouldn't march because you could correct, you could get coronavirus and you can die. They're saying, we're dying already. <laughs> You're not showing us how to live. So don't tell us how to die. 
they no longer feel as though life is worth anything if they don't feel as though their life is something. And so it's challenging to go to the young people now and say, if you go in March, you can get coronavirus, which you can't see. When they're saying we are being killed by police that we can see. So it's a difficult sell. So all we can do at this time is to hand out masks, give people instructions, encourage them to protect themselves, wash your hands, cover your mouth. If you feel ill, uh, go to the doctor. All you can do right now is give them instructions mm. because they are at a place where they feel they have nothing to lose. And coronavirus is the least of their concern right now. It's not on their fear level. Their fear level, right or wrong, and their thought and numbers, their fear level is they're more likely to be killed like Floyd mm. than to be killed by coronavirus. Yeah. That makes plenty of sense. Actually, the way you just put it is the best way I've seen it put. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so, yeah. Eric, one of our final questions is going to be, how do we hold on to hope and how do we help other, others hold on to hope? And obviously, not only even the coming months, but what even could be the coming years? I, I am extremely excited and extremely happy. Uh, I was a little concerned because history has taught us that the winds of change have never been blown by adults. The winds of change have always been blown by young people. Right. When I was in Soweto, South Africa, I saw the movement of young people deciding they did not want to learn only the Africana language that would not allow them to participate on a global level. And they fought, it was middle school students who were shot in Soweto marching saying they want to be free. If you look at Cuba, during the Fidel Castro's beginning regime, it was young people who stated they no longer wanted to be colonized by plantation owners. Uh, you can go to even Vietnam, the young people who lived in the Coochie Tunnels and uh, decided they want to be free. Mm -hmm. Right here in America, during the civil rights movement, when Dr. King hit a wall and adults were afraid of the dogs and the billy the billy clubs and the water hoses in Florida, one of the most important momentums in the movement came when young people stated they wanted to march and the schools locked the gates to keep the young people inside and the children tore the gates down from their pressure to go to the streets to be arrested and locked up. They said they wanted to be free. I think that the young people in America reached a point of so much comfort that I thought and was afraid that their opportunity to change the globe would have passed them by during this generation. But somehow they have found their voice and they are now taking a deep breath and they're blowing the globe in the right direction in the continuous fashion of those young people of yesteryears, the SNCs that fought for integration, the other young people movements that happened all over the globe and so I'm excited. Uh, I believe that we're on the right path with, fight it, with following the right mechanism. These the young people are so important for change. And I'm just a coach. This is not my moment. I'm 40 years of fighting against police abuse. Uh, it is time for me to now get out of the way and just give the advice and counseling when asked from my young people of how to navigate change. And I encourage them all the time, no matter how good they are with their raw talent, the culture has an ability to take your raw talent and turn you into the champion that you want to be. So don't disconnect yourself from your coaches. I encourage them to have a mentor, speak to someone who has already gone through this, even if they fail, we, are, we have not made movement. I share with them, you're not drinking at a water fountain that says blacks and white only. You're not sitting in the back of the bus. You're not having someone pull you out of your home in the middle of the night. 
we've made a lot of progress and they must continue that progress and they do it by having the right relationship with those who have already experienced it. And I am excited about what tomorrow offers to us as Americans and also most importantly, what it offers to us as human beings. So beautiful. And so Eric, to wrap up, do you have any plans on running for mayor? <laughs> <laughs> I think, you know, I say this often to people, I am so focused on the journey. I think the universe takes care of our destiny. We spend too much time focusing on the destiny and not understanding the journey. I think this is an alchemist moment for us. Mm -hmm. When the young man walked through the house with the oil and the spoon, he spent so much time focusing on not dropping any of the oil that he missed the beauty of the house. Mm -hmm. I don't care if I finish this journey with no oil left in my spoon. I want to appreciate the beautiful journey that I'm on to meet good people like yourselves. And if the ancestors in the universe determines that City Hall is something for me, then let them deal with that. Right now, I'm focusing on the journey. That is so, so beautiful. And Eric, thank you so much for coming on today. It's such thank a pleasure you. to know you. And if Good we to wanted, see you guys. <laughs> and if we wanted to follow you, it should be at uh, BP Eric Adams on all social media, right? Yes, at BP Eric Adams on all social media. Thank, thank you, guys. Thank, thank you so much. You too. On. Thank you. <laughs> see you, Eric. <laughs> thank you. All right, all guys. All right. Wow, that was great. Wow, what a speaker, man. I had a million questions I still wanted yeah, to ask. I'm sure. I'm and sure. there were even some of our audience members that had questions for him. Yeah. But that's okay. We'll leave it for yeah. another time. Yeah. But grateful for the, for the interview. Yes. And yeah, so if you want to follow us, uh, follow us at Seize the Moment Podcast on um, Facebook and on Instagram and at Seize underscore podcast on Twitter. Yep. Uh, like, subscribe, hit the, bell hit the bell on YouTube. And then also you can find us at the O4L online network at O4L online network.com and under the STM podcast section. That's and right. so obviously one more thing before we go, um, are you stressed that you can't leave the house or keep up with the routine fighting with chronic conditions such as diabetes and hypertension, having trouble coming up with healthy ways to feed the family or simply need that support system set up to make your goals a reality? Vera with Verified Nutrition offers a 15 minute consultation on her website at V E R A F I E D N U T R I T I O N dot com. You can read more about her individual journey, her experiences, send her a message, and check out her blog and the services she offers. And make sure to <laughs> make sure make the choice to get verified. verified. <laughs> Damn it, I screwed that up. <laughs> Uh, so, guys, look forward to our episode next week. We also have, in two weeks, we have uh, oh, Kirk, Kirk Schneider, Schneider. Kirk Schneider coming awesome. back on. So, yep. we're looking forward to that. Thanks again for watching. And one more little additional thing. Uh, also, our podcast can be found on all, uh, everywhere where you get your podcasts. Right. Trying something new there. Okay, cool. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, guys. See you guys next time.